It's Saturday, October 16th, 2021, and you're listening to episode 580 of Fear the Boot, a show about tabletop role-playing games and a little bit more. Running time for this episode is one hour and one minute. Welcome to Fear the Boot. My name is Dan. This is Wayne. And my name's Jeff. All right, so before we dig into it, we've got a quick announcement. I'm going to post this over on Kickstarter, too, because someone over there requested an update. So just to let you guys know, we do still have a reservation for the upcoming Fear the Con. In-person Fear the Con. Yes, an in-person Fear the Con, not a Fear the Con online or anything. Not, Not to denigrate that, but that's just not what we're talking about. We're talking about the real deal. And assuming that... There's no new disease issues, and we're not swapping nukes with China. Then, come June of 2022, we have already locked in the reservation with the location, put the credit card down, the money's still there, all of that, with the Wing Nighter Social Mixer on the 16th of June 2022, and then the con itself on the 17th and 18th. And Wayne indicated that the room block for the discount rate is locked in from June 16th through the 19th. At this point, with everything that's happened in the world, I think I will be there even if I'm sitting there in a radiation suit with a pile of caps, bottle caps, Mm -hmm. just as long as it's not illegal to have it. Right. That's the the only reason we would cancel at this point, I think, is if it's illegal to have it like it was... Like, people are going like to get has fined, been. thrown in jail, and the venue is locked and chained shut. That's yeah, only which, how we're not going to have this. I, I'm not going to make any value judgment on this, because that's territory I'm not looking to wade into. But St. Louis County, which is where we live, we say we're in St. Louis. We're technically in St. Louis County, not city. It's, it's a long, detailed thing to explain the relationship between the two. But... St. Louis County has been on and off banning gatherings. So there is the possibility they could still do something to screw with us. But our current intention, Mm -hmm. even if it's just a bit inconvenient, as long as it is legally possible, is to have the convention. Once again, the social mixture on June 16th, the convention itself on the 17th and 18th of this coming year, 2022. So hopefully that will occur. All right, so let's get down to the topic. This is something, I don't know what inspired Wayne on this, but I can definitely hone in on this a bit myself because it's come up in my West Marches game, which is making a plot point or making something that's going on in your game personal to the player character so that they care about it. So now... Wayne, I'm going to explain where it came up in my West Marches game. Where did it come up for you? So for me, it was my D&D game that I run on every other Monday online. And one of the players had mentioned that the big bad cult that's out there, they're going to fight the cult because the cult's the bad guys. They're the good guys. But it wasn't personal for his character yet. The bad guys hadn't done anything to make it personal. And that was something they were asking for. As I got thinking about it, it's like, well, this is something I wanted to do anyway. I was already working towards, but I don't want to do the tropes. Mm-hmm. I don't want to make it personal by finding an NPC they like and killing it, finding an NPC they like and beating it until they care, finding a business they like and burning it to the ground, mm-hmm. or one of the other ways of just generally making them care by destroying something they care about. Yeah, I love that. and that's a good place to start, is thumbscrews work. They're an option, but I think they're an overused tool. Taking someone and saying, well, you now basically care about this plot point because it is fundamentally Mm revenge-driven or it is existentially necessary. And let me explain those two in turn. By revenge-driven, I mean you want to go over here and look into this thing because this particular bad guy killed your parents or killed an NPC you cared about or burned your end down, or something to that effect. That's kind of cheap yeah. trick number one. Cheap trick number two is to make it an existential threat. That if you don't go over here, the dragon is going to annihilate everyone and everything, and therefore 
you only have the illusion of choice. Well, or the same sort of thread on the second one where it's preemptatory. Like, it doesn't even have to be a dragon that's going to destroy the town. The cult or the mob, because that's why I keep hearing in all these examples, it's, it's, it's very much like the mob, right? The mob has not burned your favorite mother down. The mob has not kidnapped the inn yet. But it's going but to. But it's going to. Yeah. So you have to get on that revenge train before that happens. Yeah, preemptive revenge. Right. So that's I think, is a good place to start, is those are options. Mm-hmm. But I think they are somewhat overused options. And I hate to denigrate them like this, but I'm going to say because they're overused, they feel a bit lazy to me. Yeah, and and I think we've all done them. Absolutely. Anyone that's run a game any number of years has done no, this. No, if, if we use them, we're being efficient. If someone else uses that's them, then they're being lazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's correct. If yeah. We, yeah, it's, we're, it's, we're honoring tropes. Everyone else is lazy. With. That, that's right. To us, it's an homage. <laughs> yeah, it's an homage. So for us, it's an homage. For you, we're it's just... tours. Everyone else is a game master. For you, it's just sloppy <laughs> yeah. game. No, we're game masters. They're just dungeon masters. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you do them so kindly by calling them masters of anything. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you are dungeon journeyman. Right, right. The council may rise you up to master. Storytellers. Yeah. Because yeah. a storyteller doesn't mean they're telling a good story. Right. Yeah. Just a story. A story. Yeah, yeah, that's true. George Lucas has told stories. Right. <laughs> yeah. Boy, has he. He's told some whoppers. <laughs> no, and I think they are good options. And once again, I think they're reused, but they are mm-hmm. good options, especially if you know very little about the characters the characters aren't terribly well developed because the game's new or the players are relatively new to the hobby or you're so early into the campaign you just haven't gotten a sense of what people care about yeah because one of the things players do even good players is they write up something about their characters but then a lot of it they develop on the fly as the game plays out so if this is session one you may really not have a sense of what motivates them if it is not some really base impulse, some base instinct of revenge or fear. And one of the reasons I want to avoid it sometimes is because I've talked to a lot of players that seem to be abused players. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have a parent that's living in their game because the GM is just going to kill or kidnap that they don't want to have a business off somewhere because the gm is going to hold them hostage for that yeah and if you constantly are doing that you are conditioning your players Mm -hmm. to not give you those things that you can use for really good stories exactly don't be invested in the world and don't have anything you care about because if you do it's just thumb screws right and i was on the other side of this as a game master some years back i was running a sci-fi campaign And one of the people I was running for said, I really want to have a wife and two kids back home, but I don't want them to be used just to motivate me. So he's like, I want them there for character development, but I want to ask you as a game master to keep them off the table in terms of threatening them, hurting them, using them as cheap ways of motivating my character, because here's the one place he's vulnerable. And I agreed to that. I 100% agreed to that. To give one more thought along those lines, this is one of the things I thought about as much as I would love to play that game Wayne's going to run, which is Injustice, where I play (laughs) Mr. Freeze. (laughs) If every plot is Superman's threatening Nora, that's going to get really tiresome because all it's going to be is every game. I have to figure out how do I bunker up Nora, who if you don't know anything about Batman's villains is... Mr. Freeze's wife, who's in a cryostasis because she's dying of a disease that he's trying to find a cure to. And that's going to become every game is me trying to bunker her up. No, it's a way better story to give her a cure and make her more evil than you. Yeah, Mm -hmm. which was actually a storyline in Batman. Yeah. Another issue that a game master should look at, too, is like, let's say you've been running all kind of games and whatnot, and your players only respond with violence. Like every problem you throw at them is one of violence. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, geez, that's all my players want to do. They just want to kick in doors and beat stuff. Well, 
take a moment and ask, how are you motivating them? Because if you're motivating them with mob actions, mob actions get mob responses. Let's look at the movie, The Untouchables, because, you know, we're talking about all this cults. They're doing actually mob stuff. It kind of got me thinking about it. It's a great movie. It's a wonderful movie. Yeah. Very quick synopsis. For anyone who's not familiar with the movie, it's based at least loosely on historical events about a guy by the name, I believe it was Elliot Ness. Elliot Ness, yeah. Who was... G-Man. Yeah, who was a federal agent who was tasked with trying to take apart the Chicago mob. Mm -hmm. And he gathered together a bunch... Yeah, he gathered a bunch of people together, and they sort of succeeded. They definitely got Frank Nitty killed, (laughs) and... Well, so and that's what the movie's yeah. about. But they were called the Untouchables because they're the only ones who wouldn't take a bribe. Well, they wouldn't take a bribe, and also they were given such broad nudge, nudge, wink, wink power from mm-hmm. the federal government that they were almost beholden legally well, to no one. Well, let's look at let's look at the Untouchables for a moment. If you haven't seen it, stop this recording, and go and watch it. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, it, it is, is a uh, really good movie. Uh, all the costumes in it. Kevin Costner is Kevin Costner. Yeah. Sean Connery. Uh, a couple other luminaries, I'm sure. All the costumes, I believe, were like by Louis Vuitton or or some some you know super duper high end Mount Olympus level fashion designer did every single costume in the movie. Yeah. That's why the suits look phenomenal. But uh, anyway, so in Untouchables and how it relates to this actual story is what happens: mob violence. Mob violence motivates the characters to do what have a violent response. And so that's the movie. You're sitting there, you're watching the movie. That's what you expect. You lean in and say, you've ne- you don't know anything about the story and you, you don't know what's going to happen. So yeah. you're, you're really shocked by the spoiler I'm about to give you. The twist of the movie is not that they succeed against all odds. The twist of the movie is that in the face of this violence that the game master life is giving them, they respond with nonviolence. That's the twist. That's the shocking thing. Everybody who's watching the movie is like, oh, my God, they nail him for taxes. It's the accountant who can't fight. And that's kind of the joke of the character. He's this little dweeb. He can't fight. Yeah. He's the one who takes down Al Capone. And you've got, you know, Kevin Costner is a big badass. you got Sean Connery is a big badass. you got these young guys. you got this Italian guy out of the police academy who will, like, slice your face off. And he's a badass. you got all these dudes who are badasses, right? They're all protecting fans. The mob's going after their family. They're rolling up with shotguns, Tommy guns. They're ready to just go mob crazy on the mob. And that's the twist. That is the shocking, really great twist of the story is that they don't. And the reason why I tell this story is for exactly that reason. When you give the tropes of, I'm going to burn your house down. I'm going to kidnap your family. I'm going to do this mob thing, mob thing, mob thing, mob thing. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to, all this story you wrote, all these bullet points and paragraphs and sentences you wrote, I as a game master, that's a checklist for me, man. That's my hit list that you just did. The response is always violence. Yeah. And it is shocking and weird and a great twist in a story, like in Untouchables, when it is not. Yeah. So one could theorize maybe that if you use a different trope, you get a different response. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because you're right. 99% yeah, of the time, I am. violence means <laughs> violence. Yes. And even in The Untouchables, it's been a, a lot of violence. I was going to say, it's been a minute since I've seen oh, that yeah. movie. <laughs> Though, for anyone, and this is not a, a spoiler, unless you're completely unfamiliar with the U.S. history of Al Capone, of Al Capone mm-hmm. that's how the story ends, is through a relatively nonviolent solution. Yeah. But syphilis gets them in the end. There's a whole lot of violence begetting violence begetting violence begetting violence up until that point mm-hmm. where they strike the mob, the mob strikes back, so they strike back, so the mob strikes back, so they strike back. And yes, and it, up to that point, everything you described without the accountant, that's the typical outcome for these kinds of games where you do that. And if all you're trying to do is move the party from point A to point B. Or everybody's having fun and is down with it. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's all right. But I think where it failed for me and why I didn't go this route is because in the example I'm going to give for my own game. Damn, I'm going to watch The Untouchables now. (laughs) You should. It's a a well put together movie. It is. It's really good. I haven't seen it in years. Yeah, I've seen it. Not super recently, but let's say within the past decade of my life or so, mm-hmm. and it's, it's it holds up. But 
the game that I was trying to run, I wanted them to explore their characters. I wanted them to develop who they were to invest them deeper in the game. And knowing that any animal, including humans or metahumans, elves, dwarves, whatever, is going to respond to an existential threat with violence, mm-hmm. that's really not a profound development. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's yeah. pretty... Bu- I, it's kind of like you're hungry and I put food in front of you and you ate it. Mm-hmm. If anyone is shocked by this, I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that it doesn't work, but I think it doesn't always get you what you want. Uh, in fact, let me go ahead and roll into the example I was going to give. So... As I've mentioned on the show, I'm running this West Marches game. If you don't know what a West Marches game is, a link in the show notes. We did a you march to the West. Yeah, honestly, that's not too far from the <laughs> truth. There's more to it than that. I'll link an episode or two where we dealt with that. But I'm running a West Marches game for my family and some of my friends. And one of the things that I noticed is in total. The pool of players in a West Marches game does not always have all players in attendance at once as part of the intention. But one of the things that I noticed within the pool of, let's say, maybe 10 players or so that are in this game, we had really only developed the backstory and the personality of two of them. That means there's, let's say, eight people at the table who have never really had a chance to develop their characters. And when I say develop the characters, I don't just mean the spotlight was on them. Now, the spotlight was on these two people, but the spotlight was on these two people in a way that made them develop who their character is, what they value, what they're prepared to trade for certain boons or certain progress toward goals that they individually have that, once again, were not something as maslow simple as you're under threat and therefore you respond with violence who are these people at that deeper level who are these people you know in a more idealistic sort of way so i decided you know what when it's my turn to gm this game i'm going to start going around the table to all of the other players that we've not developed and i want to put the spotlight on each of them for a game in a way that doesn't exclude everyone else but is primarily about their character. So they get a sense of who their character is. They get a chance to feel it out and to invest more deeply in their character. And I was originally going to focus in this most recent game on my nephew, Eli, but he was not able to attend. So instead I went after his dad, my (laughs) brother-in-law, Adam, who's playing a furbolg from Volo's guide to whatever, And, you know, he's playing this, this nature sort of creature. I don't know. They're kind of goblinoid ish. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Not exactly, but they're really into nature and the natural world and things like that. You didn't listen to the episode on playing weird characters. Oh, dude, this whole game is a freak show. (laughs) Right. I don't think there, no, I take that back. There's one human in the entire group, (laughs) which in turn makes the human weird and freaky. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> and and I'm not going to even dodge this totally. So I'm part of the freak show cuz sure. I was I was going to play something more normal when I realized everyone else was playing something freak show. It's like I give up. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play a freak show too. But so he's playing this furball. And I decided, you know, I really want to develop his character. I really want to understand where his value system goes exactly who he is. I want to get him off the bench and and caring about this in a very personal way. Well, the cheap answers are, okay, he cares about nature. I can start burning down the woods (laughs) or what? And it's like, no, you know, if I played a druid or a furball, some, some naturey nature, hippie nature guy. And I felt that the game master was doing stuff like that, leaning to heavily on the tropes and be like, I burn your forest down. I'm like, yes, you have renewed the forest. It needs a good burning to <laughs> fertilize the earth so new nature can grow. You know how much nature is going to grow over the next 150 <laughs> years? Hell yes, thank you, evil guy. Yeah, you've cleaned <laughs> out all the excess brush. Right. And those nasty goblins, you ran them off too. The animals will come back. Nature always. You know, wins. it's like, well, I and I could corrupt the woods, but we've already done that. I won't bore with the long stories of the plot of this game. 
But we've already kind of done some stuff about the lands being corrupted by various spiritual I'm forces. true neutral. The, if the woods didn't want to get corrupted, it would have fought back harder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so what I decided to do instead... Wow, that's some Anne Rand shit. I never thought of them as true neutral. <laughs> was Holy. Firbolgs, they're very solitary. That once they reach a certain age, they tend to ditch their family... Mm-hmm. And they go off on their own, and they live these very solitary lives. Because it's so ugly. Well, actually, that that's not entirely untrue. If you read what they wrote in mm. Volos about verbal characters, that's not entirely untrue. <laughs> Mom and Dad are like, you ugly. You don't. <laughs> so I decided instead what I was going to do was I had... A group of furbolgs. Now, once again, that's not supposed to happen. Furbolgs mm-hmm. don't tend to congregate. So there's this group of furbolgs. So it was a lot of like three or four. Maybe they them. were Shriners. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they were Moolah furbolgs. Right. They, they, they were, were driving cars. around in their, yeah, their little red cars yeah. with their <laughs> fezzes. It's charity, man. It's all, yeah. I mean, they love helping kids. Yeah. And they love drinking beer. Exactly. Yeah. And they've, they've got a charity hospital yeah. somewhere. It's, very, it's kind of bizarre. It's out of place for D&D. But, yeah. you know, whatevs. Yeah. But... They started reaching out to him, like on this dream level through the mm. Fey and whatnot, calling to him to come to them. And so he goes out on this quest, and the group goes to, to see what is it they're calling him for. And when he gets out there, he comes to find out that these people have kind of taken the ideology of preserving nature and taken it to extreme, that Nature is about death and rebirth and all this stuff. And so they're like, you know, if we were to accelerate those cycles of nature, we could kind of starve out a lot of the evils of the land because even a goblin's got to eat. And so you take away their food sources because nature's sort of speeding up. It's going through the seasons and cycles faster. And I don't want to get into the detail too much, but there was this other stuff going on that fit in with his ideology and was not in any way existentially threatening the party because these fur bulbs were actually inviting the group Mm. to participate in it. Right. And so the question became, where do your values lie? Will you believe what these guys are saying enough that you sort of say, yeah, you've got a point and join them. Or do you say, no, I disagree with them. And if so, how far are you prepared to go to stop them? Mm-hmm. Will it be discussion? Will it be turning them into some authority? Will it be fighting them to the death? I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's where are you going to go with this? Yeah. But they were not, once again, they were not directly threatened. This group well, was actually inviting them in. It's like you said, it gives the players a choice. They can lean on their characters and their personalities to do what they want to do to to explore a story how they want to do it. When you do the mob thing, you don't talk to Al Capone. Or maybe you do once, and then you walk out with broken thumbs. And the options are a lot limited. The trope expectations are a lot more limited. It's pretty clear what the Game Master wants when you say, well, you know what, my family's really poor, and... I don't know, my friends, we, we're kind of tough adventurers, but we don't want any problems here, but we're not paying you protection money. Yeah. We're not going to turn you in. We're not paying the protection money. It's cool. Just just leave. Just please leave. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the bar's on fire the next turn. Well, what's the response to that? Yeah. You know? You know what makes players hate a bad guy even more than that bad guy doing something to an NPC they care about? If they were their friend? No. If the bad guy has tricked and manipulated them into doing something for them mm. yeah. so they do the big good thing and they're all proud and happy they've done the good thing and then they see the side effects are something that the big bad wanted mm-hmm. yeah players hate feeling like they've been tricked yeah one of the things i did in my D game my players had picked up a juvenile mimic mm-hmm. i'm doing a lot of things from uh, the newest book tasha's and so they'd had this juvenile mimic. It had been you around for a love while. love mimics. I do. <laughs> oh, wait, here I did. Mm. So this mimic had been around for a while. I used some of its abilities, like mental communication, to actually save them at one point. Like uh, somebody had br- assassin had broken in and was getting ready to try to strike while they sleep. And the mimic mentally woke them up in time. Mm. So this mimic is already something they care about. 
they're doing this mission where they've heard there's a abandoned town up to the north. They go there. The town looks like a everyday normal town, except there's nobody there. Mm-hmm. And then they realize their mimic had snuck up with them. As this all goes on, I'm pulling from a lot of different things. But one of the things is Tasha's has what's called a mimic colony. Yep. Hmm. The whole town is a mimic colony. It like is hundreds of mimics, chests, hundreds or? of mimics that have come together to form the entire town. So oh, as they're they walking, like chairs and buildings. Yes, they yes. People and, and chairs and buildings, and they're, they're not gotcha. necessarily aggressive. Yeah, it, it's yeah. a really. I actually am using a mimic colony in my game as well. There's a black market sort of ne'er do wells town that's on the outskirts that basically a lot of mimics who have been driven out of the western lands by greater evils have cut this deal where they are the town. If you sit on a chair, it's a mimic. Mm-hmm. If you're in a tent, it's a mimic. If you turn on a lamp, it's a mimic. But they're that, not aggressive. They're not going to bite you for turning yeah, the lamp. exactly. And that's what my big bad had done. They might charge you 50 bucks. but My big bad had taken these mimics and basically enslaved them to make a training town, to make labs for his magical things. Hmm. And when they get there and they find out this is their juvenile mimic's family, Mm. they realize what's going on. They start talking about, well, I would have expected this to be in the town. And then the thing shows up. So they figured it all out. They eventually communicate with the town, free the town, and then come to the realization, we've just freed about a thousand mimics that have wandered into the woods Hmm. and into the neighboring towns and into the neighboring dungeons. Hmm. And by doing their good of freeing the mimics from the bad guy, they've made life worse. They've made life worse for yeah. everyone around. Yeah, and that that was something that did make it a little more personal. I, a few twists here and there of they've won, they've beat the bad guy, but there's consequences. Did I ever tell you about my mimic idea? No. So I came up with a mimic, and it is a mimic that likes cold dark places to mimic this very solitary doesn't really want other beings living things around and whatnot yeah that's actually the default state of most mimics and it's a mimic that lives in your refrigerator is a styrofoam pack the clamshell one yeah (laughs) right and when it opens it its mouth it looks like old food it's not old food it's like the internal whatever of the mimic and so when you open your refrigerator and you have leftovers it has kind of like hidden in a way the best it can. And you put the leftovers in there and that's its food source. It eats the leftovers, then pretends to be the leftovers. But it's in like a bachelor college student or whatever who like you, Dan, who never eats his leftovers. Yeah. So it's yeah. actually a symbiotic relationship. So instead of having rotted leftovers in your refrigerator, you have a mimic that eats them and takes care of them for you. Yeah. And every time you open the refrigerator, you have to make a perception check. Not every time you open it up because you expect there to be leftovers in there because there's always is whatever. When you put new leftovers in, you have to make perception check of, wait a minute, why is there leftovers still in there? I or where's the old leftovers? You know, maybe you just don't get it. I need that mimic. You do need that mimic. Not not for me, but because Amy. No, for you. No, (laughs) because Amy keeps bringing back leftovers, Mm. putting them in my (laughs) fridge, and then I have to clean them out. Mm -hmm. So if I had a mimic in there, and I wouldn't be too bothered by it because mimics aren't evil. There's, it's yeah. a, well, this mimic they're, they're, neutra- they're neutrally yeah. aligned. Yeah. They're not. I, I want a mimic that makes this form of a trash can. Mm-hmm. That yeah. would be awesome. Feed it all the time. Yeah, dump yeah. your. But you got to step on it to like get to open its mouth, and maybe it's into that. But, I, you know, yeah, it's, so it's kind of funny. They took this mimic. They call, they named it Mystery. Mm-hmm. They built something to put behind it, so when it's running around on its legs around their guild hall, mm-hmm. it's got little spinny things. They <laughs> turned it into a Roomba. <laughs> and then it dumps it all into the mouth of the mimic who eats the stuff and it goes away. Yeah. My well, group okay. did take one of the mimics. It Wayne, was... it doesn't go away. No, it doesn't. Mimics poop. <laughs> <laughs> My group, they did pick up a mimic and it was originally like a small like brass lamp, mm. but it keeps eating things. And so like it went from a little lamp to a lantern and now it's like, <laughs> now it's like a big old hooded lantern. It keeps it's growing turn into like a lamp post. Yes. Yeah, so at thing. some point, this thing's going to oh be my like, God, a, it's like a lighthouse. I was going to say, yeah. that's where it's going to end up. This thing's going to end up as a lighthouse, mm-hmm. but yeah, they're not yeah. evil. They're neutrally yeah. aligned, at least I, in the current. I love edition. mimics. They're just mm-hmm. so much fun, but that's something I've done in other games too. The bad guys tricking the good guys. Mm. Going back to one of the Dresden Files games, 
you know, had a player that was very much the mother like player who went and found what she thought was a group of uh, magical people that were in danger. And they gave her a necklace to help mm-hmm. protect her that in reality was a bug was yeah, listening, listening in guys. on yeah. everything they did throughout the entire session until the very end of the session, they interact with some cabalic magicians who look at it and say, don't you know what that is? Right. And I could not have made her hate the bad guy more <laughs> than having her walk around telling the bad guy the play ads all day. Mm-hmm. Wayne, that's that's a true story. In fact, that's actually how it worked out in my game as well. Because when these Firbolgs finally got the group out there to where their camp was out in the middle of the wilderness, they were singing this hymn and they taught this hymn to the rest of the party and got them to join in basically their little drum circle. And only two characters out of all the people there did not get involved. One was mine who I was GMing and had a PC in there. Mm -hmm. So whatever. But the other was Amy who was rightfully a little bit skeptical of this, but the rest of the group got involved and then only realized partway into it that the song they were singing and they were trying to teach everyone was that song of death and renewal. And so they were participating. It was also had a a layer of enchantment to where once you started singing it, you had to make saving throws to stop singing it. Hmm. And there are two bards in the party, but neither of them are sufficient level yet to counter song. And so they were participating in it. And by the end of it, Adam's character, who is super compassionate, even keeled, understated whatever so by the end of it he there was only one of the fur bulgs left alive long story how that happened which i'll spare everyone but there's one of the fur bulgs left alive and he ended up feeding it <laughs> to a bunch of hungry lions because he was mm-hmm. pretty miffed about the way this had all gone down and yeah it gets to people when you pull them into or bum rush them without forcing them right but you just play off their nature to say you know well doesn't this look great everybody loves chocolate cake and so people don't like conflict they don't like confrontation and as much as there are people in this world who are curmudgeons who say you know all people are terrible people are terrible all people blah 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 people generally give the benefit of the doubt Maybe they don't meet a stranger on the street and think they're a saint, but generally speaking, if somebody isn't doing anything bad and is not hurting anyone and is generally just kind of like hanging out and being chill, well, yeah, you instantly kind of think that this is a person who's chill and kind of hanging out. And they're secretly maybe a bad guy. Yeah. Now, you have to be careful with that, okay? so yeah. That's so it, another thing you can overdo. Yeah, You overdo something like that, you might as well overdo burning their house down and collecting protection money from grandma because it gets to a point to where a player might say, I can't trust any NPC. And you're like, no, this is literally your mother who loves you. I don't trust them. I check for traps on your mom. You know, it it gets that. But is is my mom lying? Well, let's. She said happy birthday. Well, let's call a spade a spade here. What's really going on there is a metagame truth, which is it's not that you don't trust your mom, it's that you don't trust the GM anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Because the GM has, they've come up with a one note GMing style. Right. I mean, you were talking about how this problem works in multiple directions, and you're right. Everything's a nail to a hammer. But similarly, everything's a screw to a screwdriver. Mm-hmm. So you know you have a singular solution or a singular trick to everything that you do. Then eventually, the players are going to pick up on that and say, "Well, wait a minute, Chad's running this <laughs> game, and everybody betrays us, so we're just not going to trust anyone." Well, let me ask you guys: this. kind of turn the camera in on us. What do you think that some of our go-to tropes are what do you think that some of as game masters what do you think like what do you guys think is my problem not problem but what do you think is a trope that i lean on in regards to this topic too much i can give you one of my own that Mm -hmm. i know sure because i've done it two campaigns in a row and i have gone to the mind control Mm -hmm. villains two campaigns in a row yeah 
That is now a trope. I cannot touch that with this group mm-hmm. in any future games, at least for a long, long time. time. Yeah. And it's not even that I'm using it on the players. I did use it on one of the players, but well, there was consent and I was down with it. And it was exactly. Awesome and yeah. But even doing that as something where they're finding NPCs that have had their minds messed mm-hmm. with, that is now a, yeah, a trope we, that I use twice. Mm-hmm. I can't do it again. For we a while. hate the NPC because the NPCs has done multiple bad things. The main bad thing is a violation of people's free will. They know they're being controlled. They can't stop it. I mean, it's just like, okay, you know, this isn't even a conversation anymore. The person has to be stopped yeah. sort of yep. thing. And it was, it, it is, I was about to say it was, it is awesome. It is really good. And I agree with you. That's a story beat you yep. can't touch for a long time. Well, and to make it worse from a trope standpoint, both times I did it, it wasn't the big bad. It was the big right. bad assistant. Now, in the first game, it really was the big bad yeah. that you it just was thought it was the bad. assistant. Yeah. But then in real. the next campaign, it was the assistant. It was the assistant. Yeah. I think the one that I go to too much, and this has become a bigger issue for me in my current game, because since there are multiple people GMing the mm. game, and many of them are newer to games. For some of them, this is their first role-playing game. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, they are not just playing, but also GMing, which I gotta give them mad props for having cojones that many people have been gaming oh, yeah, for decades definitely. don't have. Mm-hmm. These are people who have been gaming for like five games and they want to GM. I got mad props for that. But they tend to follow the pattern, and one of my patterns that I use too much in games which I got to back off on now because other people are latching on to it, mm-hmm. is the thing that ought to be over isn't. Mm. That's something that by all appearances in the distant past... always a deeper conspiracy. No, not even that. It's it, Well, yes, but it's a yeah. specific thing of something that ought to be in the distant past and long forgotten, and everyone thinks it's in the distant past and mm. long forgotten. You did that with Skies of Glass. I, exactly. Yes. In Skies gotcha. of Glass, that came up. Some of the problems you were dealing with were a hundred years old and predated the nukes Mm -hmm. or at least the nukes going off, not nukes in general, but the, the nuclear war in the D and D game, I started dealing with these kind of long forgotten cults and dead gods. Mm -hmm. And then some of my players started keying into that when, when they ran games, they went back to that same well. And now it's become a very, very tired paradigm of the game that I've got to start getting away yeah. from. You know, I am doing that in my D and D game, but that was the setup for the game. Yeah. They all knew there was a cult that is probably going to be back again. That used to be there. And it's not something that I normally do. So well, it's the Lord yeah. of the Rings thing, you know, isn't yeah. Sauron dead for a thousand years or however yeah. long it was. Yeah. You know, the piece of advice that I would give you, Dan, on that, I, I can't give you Wayne one because you already know what the I already know. Is. And just, I'm not going to do it again. Yeah. Just don't do it again. For you, Dan, what I would do is I would challenge you to the next game you run, whatever it is, don't have the big bad, the the whatever, either it's a concept or an individual, whatever, what is the main antagonistic concept of your game, don't have it be something you make. Have the players, when they collaboratively make the group and they're talking about their past and their family and their NPCs and their where they're from and why they're doing what they're doing. Start drawing the connections from that and pull the antagonist either conceptually or as a person, whatever, out of that. I'm going to go farther than that. And You're going to go into the deep past. <laughs> I, I don't No, no, no. I, farther the other direction. And I don't want to dwell on this too sure. long because there may be an entire episode in this. Because the problem is when people talk about their characters, they tend to talk about the past. Mm-hmm. And so inevitably, that's where you end up looking. Yeah. I think I may go to an, a far extreme, something I have never attempted before, because the next game I'm likely to run is going to be my turn at the wheel of mm-hmm. the Blades in the Dark game, which I realize I'm three or four GMs down or whatever. But that's fine. Get to arm wrestle Eric for it. I think I actually may have the group design the villain. Mm. Love it. Knowingly. Like I'm say, in. I, I want I, you guys I to love design. That 
I want you guys to design the villain, knowing it's the villain. I'm right. not, not going to say design an NPC and whoops, it's the villain. Yeah. No, I'll say design the accountant. <laughs> yeah, I want you guys, because you're a gang, right? Right. You're, you set your own goals. Not everybody's coming after you. You're going after people. Mm-hmm. Who you want to go after? Right. And you, they tell me whatever, and I'm just going to roll with that. Mm-hmm. One but, thing I've seen Chad do that I've picked up on, you can tell me I'm wrong about it if I have... I've seen you in one or two campaigns give us something as a kind of side starter mm-hmm. just to see what the characters do and who they are and then develop the entire bad guy plot after we've already done the first mission. Yeah. No, I do that all the time. I, yep. That's what I'm saying. I've, <laughs> seen, I've seen picked up that that's something yeah. you do. Yeah. That way you never can get stuck in that this is something in the past mm. that everyone thinks is gone because you're developing it after the campaign started. Yeah. Yep. There's a I, I just need to get the campaign to like just give it a little bit of a nudge to get the wheels kind of rolling and I need to see cuz it's not a it's not on a track, right? It's not a, I'm not kicking the wheels of a train to get on the track that I'm laying in front of it like, you know, Tom and Jerry or something. But it's like this is the wagon and I kind of kick it and I need to see where the players are interested in going down the hill. And then I can just theme everything off of what the little kick I established. I just theme it on the path that I perceive that they're interested in. Yeah. And I think one thing on a, a related topic here that I found that helps me with the broader issue we're talking about here of giving them something to chew on that is developmental without being violence because violence is don't look outside the characters, look inside the characters. And I realize at first that sounds counterintuitive because the problem, as we stated, is what if the characters aren't all that well-developed? Mm. And so you're trying to give them plot points to struggle with to get them to develop more. And so maybe you don't know enough about them, but you can look at what you do know. If, for example, let's go back to the case of Adam Sverbolg. Well, I know he's playing a Sverbolg, I know that fur bulgs are really connected to nature. They're all but fey creatures. I mean, they're not quite, but they're damn near riding that line. And I know that fur bulgs tend to not congregate. And so these facts alone allowed me to create an anomaly. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, here are fur bulgs reaching out to other fur bulgs, and they themselves, even though it's not a large group of them, most there's like three of them, Nonetheless, they have congregated and they're trying to call out through the world to the other furbolgs out in their ones and twos to come and join them. And the thing that they're screwing with is the magic of nature. So these are things I didn't have to look real deep to understand that these were going to motivate him. You know, and I think with most characters, you can look at the simplest attributes of them and without once again knowing a huge amount know that there's something there that's going to motivate them if somebody was playing a dwarf well assuming they aren't playing something really weird like an overland mm-hmm. dwarf or something i'm like well okay back at the cave system or the mines that you come from there's something going on with your family where i i don't know i'd, I'd have to think it through. trees are invading yeah i don't know what it is well that gets back kind of the violence because of violence <laughs> But, you know, I, I could think it through, but sure. I could probably come up with something that speaks to what little I do know uh, that, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe it's not violence because violence. Let's go with, let's say, OK, the dwarves have a really close clan or family connection and your brother went out on an expedition and hasn't been seen since. You just got word that your father has written the name of the local mayor in his book of grudges. Yeah. Now, yeah. what that means is you can't fight City Hall. So you can't go in there and say, I'm going to kill the mayor. You don't even know what's going on. And, and you know your father's yeah. got a little bit of a screw loose. So instead of violence beginning violence, you have violence where you got guys, we got to go back yeah, to, the cave to stop, stop the violence. This. Yeah. You got to get your dad to take him out of the book of grudges. Right. Oh, oh my God. How do you even do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do you even do that? Yeah. Or your little brother went off on an expedition because he believes that your family is actually descended from a noble line. Mm. And those records only exist in a lost dwarven fortress three layers down into the Underdark, and he's gone missing. 
So, and you're just trying to get him back, you know, whatever. It doesn't have to be violent in nature. I mean, it could be, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be. This leads me to another idea. With Is this. it a and d game where we play the Untouchables and we have a B-plot <laughs> of a guy, your father, writing a name in the Book of Grudges he shouldn't? And I have a no. sawed-off bar. I mean, I I'm love, in. I love that idea of so the I. Book of oh, Grudges yeah. and such. <laughs> But that leads to the question of, okay, you've now made it personal for that character. Yeah. Do you want to make it personal for everyone else? How and, do you make it personal? Yeah. And so I did that in one of in mm-hmm. my D&D game. One of the characters came in, one of the players came in and said they had a character that they played in a previous campaign, but it was a lot more of a dungeon crawly campaign. The character was a tabaxi that had never met any another tabaxi. Knew nothing it's about cats, his people. Right? Cat, 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 cat people, people, yeah. Knew nothing about his people was found and raised by a thieves guild always wanted to explore what were the deal with his people and never had a chance in a game okay so then i had another player that found out tabaxi were a thing after that and she wanted to play a cat person and her setup was she was left at a monastery Mm -hmm. okay i've got two tabaxi that don't know their people i have a b plot here they're going to at some point find their people. Stunned with the nasty back in monastery. <laughs> well, and then I then I start thinking, okay, I know they're bought into that storyline when they go to find when they go to see their people. How do I make it interesting for everyone else and tie them in? For one of the characters, you know, a wizard that is very bookish and studying mm-hmm. magic. Okay, the Tabaxi now have a magic you've never seen before. Mm-hmm. There's interest here. I have another character that's into food. Magical and, girl cat magic. No. I have another character that's into food and music. Here's a whole new culture. Still getting an anime vibe, but the cool. final one though, my cleric. Uh-huh. My cleric is dedicated to Ashari. That is the god that they're dedicated to. The cat people. I have a god that I have set for them. It's a cat god pulled from one of the books. They end up going through the storyline, and the cat god has been disconnected from the world, and it can't empower. The, mm-hmm. any of the tabaxi clerics and they eventually reconnect her she's able to go back with the other gods as i start tying in i tie this tabaxi cat god to his god even down to the point of eventually he reaches into his bag of holding and pulls out a letter and it's a letter from his god that says thank you for returning my kitty to me hmm immediately he now cares about the cat people no he had no interest in it but his god cares about their god and that's why i started doing is started drawing these lines what do they care about and how can i put that into this b plot where i already have two characters that it's personal for i want to make saving these cat people personal for everyone else i'm going to give you an answer that is 180 degrees off of what you just stated but i have found works don't bother let me explain that even if nobody else in the game cares about what the fur bulg are up to, we're friends and family. They care about what Adam's up to, right? So I'm talking about the player here, right. not the character. His, his character's name is Rabbit. I don't remember what his history was behind that name because fur bulgs don't actually speak a whole lot, but his character is just called Rabbit because he needs a name to go by. And... Even if nobody else cares about what's going on with the Furbolgs, they care about Adam. And so as a result, they're going to care enough about the plot he's involved in. Now, yep. important caveat, this was a one session, and the session, if you look at the total RP time, so taking out the snacks and the BSing, let's say three, maybe four hours tops, that was the extent of that yep. plot. Well, and This was not an ongoing arc where all we're dealing with is Furbolgs, and every because most people I think can tolerate anything or stay invested in anything as long as it's short. Yeah. Well, the other caveat in this case, they all know each other. The players do. My game was an online game where I've brought people together that didn't know each other before. So I don't necessarily have that fair personal enough. investment between yeah, fair people enough. at the beginning of the campaign. By now they've created friendships among each other and a lot of conversation and things, but early in the campaign they're all strangers. Yeah. So I did think I needed to do a little bit of and that's fair. Make it yeah, yeah. Because, massaging to get yeah, it because yeah. they don't know each other. I am not mm-hmm. contradicting your point. I am complimenting your point. Compliment with an E, as in right. to join to. 
though I will also compliment with an I your approach, but what I'm describing is a complementary approach mm -hmm. that one, as long as one player cares about it and the other players care about each other, and two, you keep it relatively brief. People can tolerate yep. the spotlight not being on them for a session. Well, and that was the other if thing. It's I, five sessions, ten sessions, you've lost yep. your group. Well, and that was the other thing I did too. I wanted to make sure I wrapped up the main Tabaxi story in one session, but now they were going to be a faction that's on the table to be bringing in and using yeah. throughout the rest of the campaign. And, and, but the focus on them was only going to be one session. Well, and one of the beautiful things I can say about this, and I'm not saying this is unique to my approach. I think this is true of any of these approaches, but it underscores why this is so important is Adam's character, who I'm not saying wasn't well-developed, but was not developed as deeply as I would like, which once again, I think is true of every character at the table outside of the two. We've spent some time, developing their backstory by the end of it it was getting pretty late because we had to start really late and so it's getting kind of late in the night and so he had to go but he's like man i really want to keep chasing this rp and interacting with these other npcs and whatever because he knew there was more ground to cover suddenly he's asking questions about his character having quandaries with his character that prior to this point he wasn't which tells me that I succeeded at what I set out to do, which was to get something deeper out of this character than the surface stuff of name, species, and class. Mm -hmm. I hear what you guys are saying about make one character have a plot and then the people rally around it. Maybe sometimes, like Wayne, you said you kind of need to maybe massage it a little bit. To get yeah, to gel, Dan. give the make it personal for the other characters yeah. as well. For me, what I have found, and Dan, what you were saying too, it's like okay, we'll make it short and personal, but make it kind of impact everybody. What I have found is, again, I, I'm going to go that what you were saying earlier too, Dan, about how you know you're right, you're both right, you're both right. It is excellent advice. It works. I've I've done it. I've seen it done. It's perfect. But I have also seen and done a sort of third way as well, where if you're running a campaign that's like a longer form campaign and over time, the characters care about each other, they gel for each other and stuff. You can have a plot that only involves one person. And if you as a game master feel that the relationships between the characters have solidified enough, those other characters are going to be like, yeah, yeah, Let's go down there and deal with this Book of Grudges thing. This is going to be a 14-month-long campaign. We're in ride or die. Well, And that's yeah. one of the things. And I've seen that before. Yeah. It happened in our Skies of Glass game. Because you're saying, Dan, very rightfully, too, that maybe the characters don't have enough depth. They don't have enough weight to them. Sure. You know, some people are like that. They kind of need to play to develop and whatnot. Look at the Skies of Glass game, where you have Brandon. Brandon come in, and he's just like, I'm playing a doctor. He's a little crazy. I mean, I, I think there was more to it than, than that, but yeah. not much at the beginning. And as he played him over those months and years and stuff, Dr. Poe developed and developed and developed, and he developed this weird friendship with Gil. And by the end of it, Gil was like, I have to do these things. You're staying here because I'm going to die. And Poe was like, no, it's ride or die. And then Gil tricked him to go and Poe was furious. Furious is neat scene. Yeah. And I've seen that too, like in the in the fifth edition game I ran, where the players were it was the opposite end. They were so developed and so integrated into the world and so integrated with each other. Every chapter of the game focused on a different and Wayne does this a lot. Yeah. Every chapter of the game focused on a different individual character. And it was never a problem because it's like your happiness, your pain, everything you're going through is my happiness and pain and your enemies are my enemies sort of thing. Yeah, I definitely think a lot of the advice we've given on this episode is early campaign advice. Yes. The things that happen when you're getting the players invested. These yeah. are the tools and things you do to make them care enough that you can get to that end point where mm -hmm. everyone's right or die. Yeah, it's, it's start. What are you doing to start the motor, to get it to fire and yeah. turn over? Well, and of course, ideally, you would have gotten some of this death back all the way in like session zero. Well, you and, know, but the reality is those always happen. 
See, that was something else I was going to bring up, too, is about a session zero. Look at the Blades in the Dark game. If you haven't listened to it, go listen to the 10 hours of Blades in the Dark, whatever. <laughs> it's a lot more than 10 hours. Yeah, that's, that's just it's three probably sessions. Probably about 40 to 60 hours right. at this point. But So that was one of the problems that I ran into. Is like we said earlier. I maybe have a little bit of a nugget of an idea, and then I pull the idea of what you guys are interested in, where we're going, and kind of off-the-cuff thing, and then I kind of spread out a campaign from that. And I ran into a huge problem. Thank you, COVID. I hate you. <laughs> but we were all online. And so we're pitching these ideas. We didn't have a pitch session where we're all together in the same room. And we're talking about and we kind of we all this stuff happens. We land on blades in the dark. At this point, it's gonna be like a one shot. Maybe, maybe two, three sessions, three at the outside most. And everybody got hyped for it. Nobody except Wayne, I believe, had actually played it before. And everybody was like, okay, this is weird and new. Okay, I can do this stuff. That's interesting. And there, people are asking questions and that sort of stuff. And everybody made their character in a vacuum. Everybody made great characters as individuals. Yeah. And as I kept thinking about it, I ran to this wall. I'm like, I don't know how to motivate these guys. I know how to motivate Wayne. I know how to motivate Dan. Same for Eric and Mike and Brandon. I know how to motivate each of these characters because they have great write-ups. But... I can send Dan off. I am not guaranteed in session one that anyone else is going to follow him or the same thing with Wayne and Brandon, all of these. And it's like, this is like, I had a game master panic attack. I'm like, this is not how I run a game. I can't do this. And so that's when I got everyone together and I, I slammed the brakes on it and I'm like, okay guys, we are getting together and we're just going to talk this out. And I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. And from that, we made a session zero where we made the, the characters together. And so as a game master, that's the advice I would give. It's not, okay, yeah, it's important to do a session zero. Yes, all that. That's, you know, we've only said that 10 billion times. It's important because it gets the players interested. They're talking about stuff. They're throwing around ideas. And what I do as a game master is I, I didn't do it in that one because I was all hyped up, but... Normally what I do is I sit back. I sit back and I listen. I listen to what they're interested in. And when it slows down, I throw a question out. Oh, well, you know, so-and-so has said that his father was the captain of the guard, but you're playing all bad guys. Is there any friction there? Then I sit back. And then there's all yeah. kind of discussion happens. And then I'm, I'm taking mental notes of where those discussions go and come from. Yeah. In our current uh, Dresden Files game, I didn't make the big bad. The big bad was actually made during the city building mm -hmm. when you guys came up with, wouldn't it be interesting to have this type of person out there? Oh, okay. I like that. Mm -hmm. And then I just continued to change and develop that mm -hmm. character as we went on. I would have never come up with that character myself yeah. as the big bad. That was something entirely that everyone was interested in the idea. And that's what created that mm -hmm. character. Yeah. And then I just started flavoring the character and evolving it throughout the course of what are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. And that worked out really well because in the beginning, we are totally actually unaware of this bad guy. Yeah. We're seeing their effects, but we don't know that. We think that these bad things happening are isolated incidents, even though we've been gaming for decades. Yeah, <laughs> You know, we're still walking into this crap. And what I believe that allowed Wayne to do as it unfolded is for you to evolve and change and hone and fine tune this yeah. character. It was a very flat character as it was created. Yeah. It did not have much to it. And the depth of the character developed over the course of the campaign as I kept thinking about it mm -hmm. until you actually finally met the character in person. Right. All right, once again, check the show notes for this, but I'll mention it here in the audio. June 16th, 2022 will be the Social Mixer slash Wing Night, and then June 17th to 18th of June 2022 will be the con itself, though the room block will continue such that you can check out, of course, on the 19th so you don't have to haul your luggage mm -hmm. around the Saturday of the con. And other than that, Check out the uh, Fear the Boot actual play. Yeah. Doing Blades in the Dark. I don't think we talk about it enough. I mean, we talk about it enough as far as the game, but oh, it's actually promoting yeah. the thing. Yeah. Uh, AP.feartheboot.com. 
And you shouldn't listen to it just for my aspect of the game because we're going to go into new territory where I think I have one more session than I'm handing the baton over to Mr. Brodeur, yep. who's going to run a minimum of three sessions. And then old then, man Hussey's got his stuff out there. Yeah, and, yeah he's got a pretty good Well, he's not going to run Blades in the Dark. No, yeah, no, no, no. But he he's does, got his own game. Yeah, he's got yeah. his own stuff out there. Right. So, which has gotten pretty good reviews. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of content on the AP feed. Yes. A previous campaign that went a long time, Very which guys time. the class. Three and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. Multiple Deadlands campaigns that Chris has run. I will. And now the Blades in the Dark campaign. Full disclosure. The Skies of Glass and Blades in the Dark audio quality is a bit rough. It's completely our fault. Yeah, we're getting there. But I've listened to it. It makes me cringe because we have this quality. I know we can do better, but it is listenable. It's understandable. You can follow along with it. Yeah. It's not It's not good, but it is comprehensible. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Beyond that, as always, thank you guys for tuning in. Have a great week and great games, and we will catch you next time. Ooh. This has been a production of Fear the Boot, copyright 2021. Listeners are free to use this episode in a non-commercial endeavor, so long as credit is provided to feartheboot.com. You can find previous episodes and other resources at feartheboot.com. If you wish to support this show and its related endeavors, you can do so at patreon.com slash feartheboot.